Michael Perryman, who is going to talk about is the Earth flat? We hope so. Uh, thank you. It's uh, an honor and, of course, a pleasure to be addressing this important Congress. And I thank the organizers, especially uh, Chris, uh, for the invitation and uh, convey, along with the other speakers, the best wishes for the future development of this important academy. And now, I've chosen the title, Is the Earth Flat?, of course, to try and draw you into my talk. But one of our Nobel laureates said to me yesterday that he was greatly looking forward to the talk because he'd long believed that the Earth was flat. <laughs> and I take that to imply that not only are we united by our scientific spirit, but also by our sense of humor, I hope. What I've tried to do is to uh, weave a little thread uh, with the contributions and the heritage of Copernicus, uh, bringing it up to date with one of the space projects which is very much in a sort of direct lineage of his uh, heritage. And I've also dared to offer four thoughts for consideration of a future academy. And that was so um, here's a beautiful a uh, gyroscopic image of, of the sky seen from the Earth. Let me start with my question, is the Earth flat? And of course, you'll be pleased to know my answer is no. The, as a scientific question, it was answered by the Hellenistic Greeks. Uh, they had several lines of uh, suggestions for this. Um, any remaining doubt was really uh, firmly put to rest by the Copernican theory. There's not a one-to-one -one association between the rotation of the Earth around the Sun and the, the Earth being flat, but there is a, a, uh, a correlation. So Copernicus made this uh, a, a great leap, um, and my preceding speaker has laid the foundations and explained why that was such a difficult concept to actually accept. And if you look into the history of this, the so-called Copernican Revolution it took actually several decades to be fully uh, embraced in scientific thinking. And there is, of course, a huge, huge, limitless body of evidence to suggest that the Earth is a spheroid. And I think the first question I wanted to raise is, do scientists, in parallel with their advance of pure scientific thinking need to communicate uh, even better with the society. So I offer that as a thought for the Copernican Institute, the Copernican Academy. Uh, do not leave the general population behind. Well, I said I was going to offer four suggestions or four points for consideration for the Academy. And that was the first uh, outreach or communication to the more general public. But the second, I, I wanted just to reflect in one view graph on what kind of science lies ahead. And I would say, um, since the start of my own career in astronomy in 1977, the pace of advance has not slowed. It's continued, and it seems to be almost accelerating. And I think there is an important message there that for the future generation, young people, there is plenty of scope for new discoveries and great opportunities for researchers and communicators. Are we approaching the end of science? Some people have written about this. In fact, people have been writing about this for several hundred years. Uh, and the answer, I, th I think, seems to be no. Some of our laureates have spoken already this morning. Uh, particle physics, there's a, a, perhaps a long way to go before a unified theory of, of matter and energy. Uh, cosmology, how and when and why was our universe created? Evolutionary biology, touched upon by Didier Keller this morning. Does it exist elsewhere? Neuroscience, the subject of consciousness. There are huge areas that lie ahead. But a paper that appeared in Nature just a month or so ago drew a kind of quite interesting analysis, which is, uh, is, is modern day science disruptive or is dis modern day science incremental? And this study was done on a, a, a vast body of literature and they came to the conclusion, rightly or wrongly, but I offer it just as food for thought, that disruptiveness, that is scientific advances that uh, make a fundamental change in direction, has uh, uh, fallen, declined in all of the research fields over recent years. 
Now, there's a lot of ifs and buts and uh, arguments that one can make, but I wanted to leave that as a second thought for, for an academy, what sort of research should be encouraged in the future. My third point is on collaboration, and uh, I want to make a couple of observations. They may be very personal. I think they can be extrapolated, but modern projects are often too large for individual states to undertake alone, and that was one of the motivations for the organization of, uh, of ESO, European Space Agency, and European Southern Observatory. Uh, these are not only financially driven, these are driven by uh, the desire to gather together key competences which are often well distributed. This is true not only in the intellectual field but the industrial field as well. If I take a mission like Gaia, it would be beyond the technical competence of any country in Europe to build that. It can only be built by pooling the immense uh, technical expertise from different dedicated groups. So my third uh, point there, international collaborations are crucial, but they benefit from very careful thinking and stewardship as well. And the fourth point, my final point, is the question on the uh, relationship between fundamental science and economic growth. Now, scientists, we are all focused and very much driven by the fact that science for its own sake is very crucial, very important, and it enriches cultural life and uh, motivation and everything else. This is all very, very important. Um, we also use the argument in science that there are unexpected spin-offs from any kind of fundamental scientific research. But I want to offer uh, as well you know, the, the kind of scientific thinking that knowledge is important for its own sake and uh, scientists can be more vague when it comes to what are the immediate benefits for, for society. And what I wanted to just make there was the point that since the 1960s there are some economists that have been studying or trying to understand the correlation between fundamental research and economic growth. Uh, this is all presupposing that you believe that uh, increased uh, economic growth is, is the be-all be and end-all of society, but this is an important consideration. And there is a general consensus on this. I will cut, there's a, a lot of detail behind this, but in the class of theories pioneered by Nobel Prize winner Robert Solow and Swan, uh, technological progress is generated by accumulated knowledge, and some of these economists have tried to argue and to develop models which suggest that there are rates of economic growth which are, can be tied directly to the amount invested in fundamental science. And these multiplicative factors do vary somewhere between two and five. But the general point is, uh, if I could perhaps make it bluntly, invest in pure science, invest in fundamental science, and there are economic uh, benefits uh, with that as well. So I, I conclude, I've touched on four aspects for consideration perhaps, along with many others for an academic society, education, research directions, collaborations, and underlying economics. 